What events preceded the fall of Rome? And, for that matter, was Alaric's capture of Rome really such a global catastrophe? After all, the emperor was in those days was not in Rome at all, and in fact the eternal city was not the capital in those days. Another rupture of the alliance between Alaric and Rome was preceded by the rebellion of Gaena, a Visigoth by birth and a Roman commander by position. The scandal produced by this rebellion was colossal. On December 22, 400, Gaena was defeated and died. What is characteristic? The winner of it became his fellow tribesman Fervita and the leader of the European Huns, who is called Ulden. Ulden and has sent the head of Gaena to Constantinople. The Romans thought that Gaena was raring to be emperor, and the Huns perceived him as a threat, as he may have wished to create a Gothic state on the lands claimed by the Huns themselves. The Romans definitely changed their attitude towards the Goths and decided to ally with the Huns, at least some of them. This circumstance probably made a strong impression on Alaric. One way or another, his tenuous friendship with Rome gave a thorough crack. After waiting for the harvest to be gathered, Alaric marched up the Pannonian River Sava, modern Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia and Slovenia, and entered Italy. Roman fortifications on the passes were absent or in poor condition. In any case, this time Alaric met no resistance in the Julian Alps. Alaric visited Aquileia. It is not clear whether he took this city. In winter the Gothic king occupied the whole province of Venetia and approached Mediolanus, modern Milan. It was there that Emperor Honorius was located. Panic arose. Superstitious Romans looked for and found true signs of the imminent end of the world. Honorius was going to flee to Gaul, away from the rebellious Goths. The weak and cowardly emperor was saved by Stilichon. He brought reinforcements, consisting of Alanian cavalry and recently accepted for service federates vandals. In early March 402 AD Alaric lifted the siege of Mediolanus and withdrew and frightened Honorius moved the capital to impregnable Ravenna. What Alaricius was up to is not entirely clear. The situation for him was worsening. At this time from Gaul returned Rhenish detachments. Given that near Mediolanus was Stilichon, Alaric could find himself between two fires. As a result, he crossed the Po River and moved southward. At the town of Gasta, modern Osti, on the Tanaro River, Alaric failed and retreated. He withdrew to Palencia and camped there. Jordan reports that Stilicho approached the Goths, unnoticed, because he attacked them, suddenly. It is unlikely that an entire army could approach the Goths without being noticed. No, the surprise factor was something else. The battle took place on April 6, which was Easter. Both opponents, Alaric and Stilichon, professed Christianity, so Alaric really did not expect an attack on the day of the biggest Christian holiday. Stilichon, however, did something brilliantly simple. He handed over command to the chief of the Alanian cavalry, nicknamed Saul, who attacked Alaric without hesitation. Alaric continued his retreat from Italy, but did not hold out, and on the way attacked Verona. Stilicho caught up with Alaric. As last time, the battle was started by the Alans, but the Goths retreated to a fortified camp in the mountains, where Stilichon locked them up and surrounded them. The Goths suffered from hunger and disease. To the Romans began to move deserters, and among them a prominent Gothic commander named Tsar. Obviously, Tsar with Alaric had some old personal enmity, and the failure at Verona was only a pretext for a final and open breakdown of relations. Nevertheless, Alaric managed to preserve the backbone of his tribe. Stilichon, as in other cases, did not finish his eternal adversary, and all for the same reason. He intended to use the Visigoths as a significant military force in the interests of the Western Empire. The interest also remained the same, to take away Illyria from the Eastern Empire and subjugate it to the West. While the Visigoths left Italy and settled, in the country of barbarians, near Dalmatia and Pannonia, from where they raided the same Illyria. 
Stilichon persuaded Honorius to appoint the Gothic king as Illyrian commander, which, of course, meant a direct challenge to Constantinople. Alaric's next campaign in Italy began immediately after Stilcho's death. Formally, Stilicho was accused of intending to put his son on the imperial throne. Much more importantly, a nationalist party prevailed in the empire. As far as one can even speak of the nationality of the Romans of that time. In any case, it was an anti German party. Romans, nationalists, did not welcome any negotiations with barbarians, much less alliances with them. In this context, Alaric appears as a savior of persecuted barbarians. First of all, the Germans, who were everywhere removed from their posts, arrested, executed. To Alaric, as they say, in those days came 30,000 people, and only the implacable Tsar stubbornly remained on the side of the Romans. Alaric again crossed the Julian Alps, moved unimpeded along the old Postamyeva road through the Lombard lowlands, crossed the Po River at Cremona and headed for Rome. The whole march through Italy took him a month. Then Alaric surrounded Rome, cut the roads and broke the grain supply to the city along the Tiber. Disease broke out in the city. There was talk of the vengeance of the old Roman gods, of rejecting Christianity and returning to the religion of the fathers, or better yet, the religion of the Etruscans, and then the calamity would recede. According to the most knowledgeable inhabitants of Rome, the Gothic king was possessed by a demon who demanded the destruction of the eternal city. However, the Romans tried to negotiate with the carrier of the demon. During negotiations, the Gothic king demanded to give him all the treasures that were in Rome and all the slaves of barbarian origin. Attribution was given, and the slaves themselves joined the barbarian army in droves. They caused a lot of chaos, but they still represented a significant force. Finally, the Visigoths lifted the siege of Rome and withdrew to Tusha, Tuscany. Ravenna, however, was not in a hurry to make peace. They counted on the strength of the new army, recruited from the Huns. In the meantime, his brother-in-law Atalf came to Alaric from Pannonia with an army. Victory again turned out to be a defeat for the Gothic king. Gold and silk clothes his people had in abundance, but things were bad with food. Alaric sent Emperor Honorius a proposal for peace, but Honorius rejected any thought of peace with the Goths. The nationalists were triumphant. After receiving another rejection from Ravenna, Alaric moved on Rome again. Now he was going to put on the throne of the emperor of his own choice. In Ostia, the Goths seized huge stocks of grain that had come from Africa and was destined for Rome. Sitting on sacks with bread, the Gothic king demanded from the Senate to proclaim as emperor the city prefect Priscus Attalus from the noble family of Antius. Attalus had been known to Alaric since the previous year. The latter had sought an agreement between the empire and the Goths. The Gothic king had hoped that the pocket emperor would obey him but he was disappointed in his expectations almost immediately. Yes, Attalus, granted, his patron the title of master of the army, and Atalf was appointed commander of the cavalry. However, these coveted posts Goths had to share with the Romans, and from the anti-German party. So, the highest civilian position in Italy, the prefect of the Praetorium, Attalus appointed an enemy of the Germans Lampadius. Soon from Africa was stopped delivery of grain and oil. In Rome again began a famine. Alaricius offered to send the Goths to Africa to take grain. Attalus strongly opposed this. He suspected that, having come to Africa, the Goths would not leave there. Therefore, he sent for the grain his man, which in Africa, in turn, was waiting for the ruler there. Hostile to all barbaric Heraclean. Incidentally, it was he who went down in history as the killer Stilichon. The situation was uncertain. Honorius then agreed to negotiate, then sent troops. In the end, Alaric got fed up with the story of Attalus. He forced his protege to renounce, before the troops lined up took off his diadem and porphyry and kept him at his place, 
however, guaranteeing his life. Purple Mantle Alaric sent to Ravenna and again offered Honorius to negotiate. This time intervened Tsar, who with 300 men suddenly attacked the hated Alaric, and managed to cause the Visigoths some damage. The brave Tsar was showered with imperial favors, and Honorius again rejected Alaric's initiatives. Alaric moved towards Rome for the third time. As in the previous two campaigns, he certainly did not have enough forces to take the city, but nevertheless Alaric entered Rome. The only reason this happened, it is said, was because famine was raging in Rome. Allegedly, a pious Roman woman, Proba, ordered her slaves to open the gates and let the Visigoths in, so that the scourge of famine would finally end. Some historians suggest that this story retains echoes of the class struggle, not without reason. According to the legend, it is the slaves who let the Germans into Rome. The fall of Rome made a deafening impression on contemporaries. It was like the end of the world. In other words, August 24, 410 became for inhabitants of empire a kind of day of local end of the world. However, Having plundered Rome and having taken from their truly incalculable riches, Visigoths have left literally in a week. Immediately there was talk of the demon, Alaric, and that he experienced in the eternal city of some mythical horror. In reality, Alaric never really solved the problem of food supply. Autumn was approaching, along with the fall and bad weather and the idea of getting to Africa and put his hand in the breadbasket of the empire was still tempting for the Visigoths. The conqueror headed for southern Italy with the intention of crossing to Sicily, and from there to Africa. To the south, the Germans first went successfully, fell Capua and Nola, but already on Sicily they could not get over, prepared for the crossing of the fleet scattered storm. It was also said that the Gothic invasion was prevented by a certain, miraculous statue. The Goths turned back, to the north, in the direction of Campania. At the very end of 410, near the town of Casenza in Brutaia, Alaric suffered a sudden death. Royalty over the Visigoths was passed to Atalf. Atalf was not a blood relative of Alaric. He was the brother of his wife but it is almost certain that the similarity between them, both external and moral, took place. Alaric I is not called the first for nothing. He is fundamentally different from his predecessors. He is an Aryan Christian. He is of noble origin, which is known not only to his tribesmen, but also to the Romans he managed to preserve the community of his people, despite a series of defeats, and had good organizational skills. Alaric tried to harmonize the power of the barbarian tribal king and the Roman imperial power. To put it more broadly, to include Gothia in the structure of the empire. He did not succeed, but the trend was well established, and Atalf continued it. Among the booty captured by the Goths in Rome was the sister of Emperor Honorius, Galla Placidia. Atalf took her as his wife and thus as if united the empire with the Goths. It was Atalf's marriage that caused his death. He was killed in the fall of 415 in Barcelona for striving for peaceful relations with Honorius. Atalf's successor Segericus suffered the same fate and for the same reason.